Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome again. Um, my name is Kanchana Vikramasinghe, and I was also supposed not to stand on one place, so I'll be walking a bit, so I get my steps as well. Um, so I came to WSO2 about two, uh, nearly three years ago, when WSO2 ended up acquiring the startup I uh, had called Platformer Cloud, um, which was based out of Melbourne, and we were building the uh, helping to build the um, Kubernetes to be uh, simpler. And um, gentlemen here, uh, Nuan Bandara, they got really interested in what we were doing. And uh, they started actually using it to build their first iteration of Curio. And then obviously, you know, we, we chat a lot. And then Sanjeev, uh, Paul Fremantle, and others have started talking about a, li a little bit about it. And then here I am. Um, three years later with WSO2, and it's been a fantastic journey so far. And um, six months into my journey, Sanjeev also asked whether I could actually lead the uh, Curio BU globally. No one left, and I, I was left with it to <laughs> lead it. So without further ado, I'll, I'll jump into the presentation. If you fall asleep, I won't blame you because it's 4 o'clock in the morning in Australia. Um, yeah, I took this um, quote out of Ray O.C. Um, this was an internal memo. He actually wrote about nearly 20, 25 years ago at uh, Microsoft. So I'll let you to read a little bit, and, and then I, I'll tell you why I actually took this quote. So if you think about it, what he's, he was trying to say, it's really, really difficult to build, test, and introduce securities with a lot of disparate tools that they had, even at Microsoft, because they had so many software engineers, and they were trying to build stuff. It takes a lot of time. What he was actually trying to say back then, we, which means Microsoft themselves, needed a platform to build and get these products out. I don't think back then a lot of people understood the need of it, but people like Ray and the others obviously were visionaries who was looking forward to understood. Probably he didn't put it in the same way that we needed a platform to build other tools that we get out of it. Today we've seen that Microsoft had done that successfully, like their 365 platform and many other platforms, because they had internally, I'm not saying that they have a single platform, but they're given the platform so the developers so they can focus on that, the end product that they're trying to get out to their customers. So I will use a few of those quotes uh, along my slides. Um, so what, what exactly this, you know, partners ask, customers ask, what exactly is Corio trying to solve? Or what problems are we trying to? Corio does a lot of things, but I try to summarize the best value the customers and the partners can get, and when they go to talk to their customers as well. Improving the, the efficiency of how developers do their development. Yes, you can try and build a platform yourself, like you heard from a lot of the other keynotes, uh, from Sanjeev, uh, Asanke in the panel discussions, etc. as well. But one of the biggest challenges is, even when you build those, the dots aren't really still connected together. They probably have to go do their code first in GitHub or whatever the place they do, and then push that out into a CI CD tool. Now they are going into another UI or a CLI to push it out to go do the build. And once the build happens, they probably push it out to another pipeline where they will do the security scanning, etc. And if it happens to be an API gateway, they go to another UI to connect that, right? So that's what we meant by improving the developer workflow in Corio. Like Sanjeeva and Asanka said earlier, Corio, you focus on building the code and handing over after you've done the code. If once you do the git commit and push, you tell Corio, and Corio CI/CD will automatically start building it for you, do all the container scanning, et cetera, and get it deployed into the platform where you want to, right? And 
and yes, the second one is DevOps engineers and platform engineers are very important. I don't think we can actually, Corio is ever going to say, we're going to get rid of you. It's not the message we want to take out to them and say, rather than focusing on writing lots of Terraforms or Ansible or whatever the other scripts, why don't you focus on getting what the, the software engineers want so they can be self-serviceable, they can go faster. So it gives them a tooling that helps them to configure things in a platformless way rather than having to write a lot of scripts. I think you also heard that Isabel talked about the security aspects of it. So when people start doing from a best practice way, it's much easier at scale. If you, see, if, if you are a four or five people company, yes, you can do it a little bit in manual way, but when you think about thousands of people, thousands of engineers, or hundreds of thousands of engineers, scaling at that with security, with all the other things baked in, is, is not simple. Finally, everyone wants to do the modern cloud native way, but how do you do it? Yes, you can do the hard way. Again, you can put all the things in and try to connect the dots. But if you use Corio, the advantage is all that things is baked in. You don't need to go learn about if you're going from AWS to Azure to GCP, because multi-cloud is, is a reality today, right? Now, if you talk to a lot of your customers, they are not sticking to just one cloud. They wanted to have multiple clouds for various reasons. It could be uh, regional availability. Uh, Australia used to have only one region. Now, obviously, they have two regions of AWS. But when they had one region, customers were worried because if that region goes down, you don't have a backup plan. So customers selected multi-cloud for those reasons. And various other reasons, like somebody might want to run their AI on a different cloud because they are more powerful than the other cloud. So those reasons, so the cognitive load on the platform engineers is, is, is a lot. They have to you know, go through and learn three clouds if your customer is going to manage uh, across three clouds. Right? Corio gives you that seamless capability across the clouds. So those are key things that Corio is trying to address, among a lot of other things as well. But when you're talking to your customers, when you're, the partners are talking to their customers as well, these are the key things we try to address. How do you put this into a picture? So in a software, uh, enterprise software lifecycle, even, even a smaller one too, you start with the code, and then your final outcome is getting that product into the hands of the customers. The customers could be internal, external. It could be B2B as well. The important, the, so that's why, uh, and the, on, the, on the developer side, I talked about the value creation. They're the people who are actually creating the value. And the consumption is at the end, whether it's a customer or internal employees, et cetera. Right? But to get there, there's a lot of other things in the middle that you have to do, which you can't ignore. And, and a lot of us know this middle area is, is expensive because the resources are scarce. And um, I, th I think in the panel discussions, um, I think Dinesh was mentioning that as lack of platform engineers is a, is a problem, for, even for them. Why that is, is they'll have to set up all these things. And these are a lot of tooling. If you look at open source or uh, cloud native tooling, there are a lot of tools that you have to do. Now, we've done the hard part, Korea. Obviously, yes, you can. Uh, like um, you heard at the keynotes, et cetera. Yes, you can build that together. But unless you're doing it as a product, if you're doing it as a project, I have seen over my 20 years as an enterprise architect, that won't work. That will work for that project, but beyond that, that platform gets stagnated, things go out of date, developers hate it, it just goes to waste. Right? If you have the willingness, if you have uh, people who are capable of managing as a product, I don't blame you if you do that, but otherwise, use Korea. So how do we um, deliver these um, via Corio capabilities? Collaboration, I think we talked a lot about it uh, earlier. And Sanjeev touched a little bit about the architecture, which I'll come to. Discovery. 
Discovery is, is very hard in enterprises. I have worked at many enterprises across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia, and even some US customers as well. Why? Because when you go to large enterprises, they're silos, and they build the same thing three times. Right? Developers come to you when you're an enterprise architect, say, how can I find this API? Where, where is this? Right? Even the enterprise architects can't answer that because there is no single repository where you can go discover. That itself is a cost to the organization. Uh, Corio gives you that in an internal marketplace. Not just the APIs, your services, but external things like your connections to Salesforce or databases, all that. And obviously, the discovery, add-on from the discovery is the reuse. So if somebody has already built a payment API that you're going to use internally, you're not going to rebuild it now that you have already discovered it. The bit about the architecture, Sanjeeva touched on a very valid point, which is a lot of, even when I was an architect 20 years ago or so, the biggest challenge is you design and you architecture it, you give it to the teams who are going to deliver it, and once it's delivered, you, you cannot really map to see what has been delivered. Um, yes, you can do it, but it's so hard because once it is in there, in the enterprise, it's hard to map to see where things are. Now, I think he showed one diagram, which I don't have it, unfortunately, here, which shows you how, in the enterprise, all the components in the different domains connect to each other. And we are adding on to it the design layer, which means you can now compare it to say, I have designed it like this. This is my runtime architecture. Why it has differed? The drift is very important as an enterprise architect to understand why it is drifting. Right? So that's something that Cori offers out of the box as well. Scalability. We do the scalability effortlessly. Why I said effortlessly is whether you use the CLI or the Cori or UI, you can effortlessly make it to say, I want this service to scale up to 100 if the load comes in. You just have to configure. You don't have to go write any YAMLs. You don't have to go write any scripts. Corio underneath will do all that for you. Cost effectively, very importantly, automatic scaling or effortlessly scaling. Yes, some other platforms also offer that too. But do they actually care about the cost? Sanjeeva also talked about the zero uh, scale to zero. Not only that, our AI team is actually working on to see even when you scale to zero, what are the resources allocated for this workload? Have they allocated too much or even too less? Too much is obviously you will save. But sometimes you allocate too less. That means the service is failing too much. The courier will be able to tell you that as well. And of course, you do this automatically. Right? Once you configure, over time, it will start recommending you to say, this configuration might be better for your organization than what you already have. I didn't put a name to this code because there's so many people had said um, security is always excessive until it is not enough. I think Isabel touched a lot on this as well. It is important everywhere of your code from start to runtime and beyond that too. So how Corio is helping here? We have shifted the security to the left, so you don't have to think about it. A lot of organizations today start talking about, how am I going to shift the security to the left? And a lot of effort is put it in to do that. Corio, by default, it's already shifted to the left. Right. And nothing you deployed or uh, create on Corio is zero trusted. And the architect is right here. You can ask more questions from him later on how he has done it, and he's written a beautiful white paper as well. Observed. So not only we shifted security to the left, so everything you do, you have to follow certain security standards, and everything you run on Corio is zero trusted. And observed. Why observed is important? Because I think, it's, I think what, there was one question for Isabel last saying, at what point you security is important all the way? Our security architects here, wouldn't disagree with me. 
Um, so observe means every single aspect, whether you're in staging or whether you're in production and you're serving real-time traffic, we will observe and tell you whether there are anomalies. Next is future-proofing. Uh, Peter Ducker said, best way to predict the future is to create it. Very good example is Apple. Apple didn't wait for you know, future to tell you what it looks like. They went ahead and created it. Right? Obviously, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have a crystal ball to say what the future would look like. But if you have a great idea, rather than actually waiting future to tell you, the best way to is to create it. Right. So how does Corio helps you here? Going from monolith to microservice. By the way, you can have monolith on Corio too. We are not saying you shouldn't. But it helps you to break it down with the cell-based architecture, uh, you know, containerizing it, going in the cloud-native way. It helps you to start with microservices. Working with AI, Corio enabling not only you to build stuff, but observe, monitor, and get those eff effectiveness with AI. Going from serverless to platformless, I think there's a lot talked earlier about this. Serverless industry knows about it. Of course, there are servers, but you don't have to manage the servers. Platformless has the same concept. There is a platform behind it, but you don't manage and operate it as a product. Offload to Corio, you focus on the code. AI Copilot. Um, Malik told me this morning that we had already released the first alpha version. I think Sanjeev and the others also talked about it. How we are looking at Corio from an AI Copilot perspective, it's a companion for you. It's a mentor for you. So Corio will start advising things, a better way to do, looking at the data of your organization and possibly how others are doing it as well. Autonomous agents will monitor and observe how your workloads are performing and be able to tell you how may be able to run it cost effectively and with better security, et cetera. Operational excellence as well. I mean, a lot of you in operations knows it's really, really hard to debug when stuff is in the production, especially when you can't test everything in production or production light. Right. So these are some of the core capabilities that we want to bring into Corio. And somehow, obviously, you can you know, go trial it with the AI capabilities, uh, the, the alpha capabilities, of course. But over time, we will improve that to say, this is your co-pilot, right? even when you're building code, building APIs, et cetera. I'm going to talk quickly about um, some of our customers and what their use cases are. Uh, IIT Hyderabad in India was one of our first customers. They were using WSO2's open source stack, and they said, we are spending about half of our DevOps engineers' time managing, maintaining these. We don't want to do this because it's costly for us. It's not the business we are in. We are a university. We are exposing APIs. They're actually exposing AI APIs for startups to use. We want to use a platform, something that you guys manage. We don't have to worry about it. They went on. Uh, Fat Tuesday, for example, I think it's one of the uh, big uh, chains here in the uh, US. Um, they integrate their APIs to the stores so they can track their inventory, sales, et cetera. Clearit is a, a, a startup in Australia. And they wanted everything we talked about earlier. They wanted to go cloud native way. They wanted the security. They wanted all these things, but in a very short period of time because they wanted to go for funding. Now, they could have done this manually themselves, but they came to Corio January. Now, they have a product ready to go MVP, and they can and go show it to the customers, and they can go for funding. Now, they couldn't have done that if they had gone the manual way. They were estimating about 12 to 18 months to build the MVP. They built it in three, uh, three months with a very small team. Uh, some of the other customers who are currently in the process of moving to Corio. Uh, two more examples from uh, Australia as well. Three Crowns, they, I think, monitor, manage like the surveillances in, um, for the councils. And they're moving all of their 
uh, microservices uh, to, to Corio. And so about, they had about two DevOps engineers. They didn't need the DevOps engineers. Now they can put the DevOps engineers to work in the development. Right? Simi is a small team, did not even bother going into the platform engineering DevOps path because they thought Corio would actually help them to do this better. Uh, they automate um, a smart automation of uh, houses, et cetera. Holmes Glen is an educational uh, institute in Australia. Uh, they were a WSO2 customer as well. And they had exactly the same uh, pain point. DevOps engineers, SREs needed to manage their platform. And they said, we are not in the business of creating platforms ourselves. We are an education uh, institute. We have limited funding, and we want to go faster, uh, deliver these services to staff and students, et cetera. They decide to move on to Korea. They have started their migrations already. I think they probably expect to finish in about another six months or so. I'm going to talk a little bit about the partners. Um, this is an Afri African probe. Um, if you want to go fast, they say go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. So I think Sanjeevo also said the same thing. The partners are very important for our ecosystem. So even with Corio, we are not planning to go alone. We are planning to go together because we want to go further. So yesterday at the partner program, I talked briefly about the new program we have and the special offers that we have for the partners for 2024 and some of the new revenue opportunities that we have. Well, I'll briefly touch on that as well. Um, earlier, earlier today, Sanjeev also said, we don't know the size of this market. That is true. I believe that is within this cloud native market uh, application uh, development market size, which is about 50 billion in about another eight years or so. Gartner, Forrester, all the analysts are trying to figure out what's the size of the IDP market. So if you ask me what's the size of the IDP market, I couldn't give you today. But this is the, the overall uh, sizing of the market. So it's, it is not a small market. Right? And there was questions around the growth of WSO2 as well. That's why we're actually putting, hedging our bets more on Korea. And new opportunities beyond just the uh, application development, there is the other opportunities like migrating to the cloud, et cetera. All that is a massive market that is a service market. That is why it's actually bigger than the application development market. And that is also growing at about close to about 30% year on year. And there are you know, very large players in this, but doesn't mean that our partners can take part of the pie as well. I'm also briefly going to touch on the platform partners we have. We have Microsoft Asia. Uh, Corio is already transactable through Microsoft Marketplace. So customers as well as partners. If you, for partners, obviously, if you have customers who are using Asia, you can transact them through Asia. AWS, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're currently doing without the marketplace. But hopefully, towards the end of this year, we will have that enabled on AWS marketplace as well. We have enabled some other uh, platform partners as well, like Avon. Avon is a database uh, offering. They offer databases, caches, Kafka, things like that. We have seamlessly integrated that with Corio. What that means is your DevOps engineers or PEs can easily enable that for the developers on Corio. We are adding more and more as we add more platform services. Vulture, who is here today, is a, a smaller uh, cloud provider. Uh, why are we bringing them in? Because obviously, we, not everyone wants to go with the bigger cloud providers. Uh, so we are, we are going into a partnership with them. So what that means is you'll be able to consume either a bigger cloud providers or low-cost cloud providers. And they are distributed in about 32 regions globally as well. Our value proposition and where we stack in the industry. Corio, if you ask me, uh, it's a fully-fledged enterprise software engineering platform. And I'll go in, a, in the next slide. I, I think I talk about our competitors, how they differ compared to Corio. And there was a question from 
Dinesh early, I think, can Corio do hybrid? Yes, Corio already doing multi-cloud, and Corio can do hybrid. What that means is you can have some workloads running in the cloud and some running in the on-prem data center as well. And we focus on the developer efficiency and productivity. In terms of value proposition, so we take three personas. How do we help developers? How do we help architects, CTOs, et cetera, and line of business managers? Given the time, I'm not going to go through all the bullet points, but I'll leave that for a second. From a developer's perspective, they love to code and get that value creation into the hands of the consumers. Architects, CTOs, et cetera, they're looking at how do I govern a, a large distributed uh, uh, you know, system, right? How do I also not lock into SaaS? The, one of the beautiful things about Corio is there is no lock-in. If you build and one day you said, not that we want you to, I am going to get out of Corio. Everything we do are very native to Kubernetes. What that means is you can run on EKS, you can run on AKS, or you could even run on on-prem. Right? Yes, you might lose out some of the things like the observability we provide, uh, uh, the logging capability, all that we provide. You might lose that. But you, your workloads are portable, and you can run anywhere. So there is no locking. And security is by default. From a line of business managers, they want to get their products out into the market faster, right? Again, I think there were some discussions. I can't remember the names of the, the panelists. Their focus is not spending the money to build a platform to build the product. They want to get the product out really, really quickly, right? So they can do that. Whether you fail fast or whether you're you know, successful fast, Corio offers you to do that. Here are some of our competitors and how, how we differ from them. Harness is a software delivery platform. So they focus really well on the delivery aspects of your application. Beyond that, connecting the dots, like uh, you're, you're delivering an API, but connecting it to an API gateway and wiring all the way through, they don't do that. They offer you to do the delivery part. Heroku, on the other hand, yes, they do somewhat similar to what Corio does, but can you go multi-cloud and hybrid? No, you can't, because they have a, a, you need to run everything on your platform. So that might suit some clients, but not everyone, because enterprises obviously have their own security, et cetera, that you need to go through. Red Hat OpenShift do a very good job on managing the Kubernetes infrastructure. Right? They're also trying to add some of the internal developer capability with Backstage. They're not there yet. I'm not saying they wouldn't catch up. At the moment, they're not there yet. Mega clouds like AWS, GCP, Asia, their biggest business is infrastructure, the computes, uh, net storage, network, et cetera. So it is kind of defeating their purpose if they actually go build a platform. I'm not saying they wouldn't. But at the moment, their focus is that, because the more the consumption of the, those three is where they're going to actually make their money. Finally, leave you with some numbers. So uh, Corio went GA in March 2022. Since 2022, we have 16,000 signups. These are signups, excluding WSO2, excluding WSO2 partners, excluding WSO2 customers that people have come just either by word of mouth or, or Googling or looking at some of our digital ads that we had. In fact, we only started the digital ad beginning of this year. Um, in terms of teams plan, we have about 67 plus PayYG. What PayYG means is as they consume the platform, they pay as you go. There is no upfront commitment. From our upfront commitment enterprise customers, we have about 29 plus to date. Finally, in terms of the, what has happened on the platform, there are about 21,000 components created in Corio platform since we, we went GA last, uh, 2022. Um, in terms of deployment, I have only taken the first, the top 20, again, excluding internal 
you know WSU run everything on Corio, including the conference app that you're using. It's run on Corio, obviously supported by Asgardio for the authentication authorization. But 70, 750,000 deployments to date. And number of API calls just from the top five customers is close to 500 million. That's without us enabling about five large customers on board. When they are onboarded, this will be in billions, right? So if you ask me, is Corio platform ready for you to do your enterprise workloads? Yes, it is.